Welcome to episode 13 of the Sports Geek Podcast, presented by Seed Conference. Today's episode is a special replay of my presentation, Digital Case Studies Explained from Seed 2013, with Philippe Dor from NASCAR. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. Your host, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. My name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek, and uh, thank you for the prompts on Twitter and LinkedIn asking where the next Sports Geek episode is. Um, traveling on crutches and trying to record podcasts is pretty much tough work, so that's why there has been a little break. I have been traveling, um, if you've been following the tweets, uh, I was in Kansas City for seat 2013. Um, so this episode of the Sports Geek podcast is actually recording of the presentation that I did with Philippe Dor, who's the Senior Director of Digital Services at NASCAR. We walked through a bunch of case studies around the world in this presentation. Um, there's a few spots in there where, the, where we show some video clips um, as well as uh, the slides from the presentation. They'll all be accessible uh, from the show notes. So if you go to sportsgeekhq.com slash 13, um, you'll be able to download them. Um, and as far as all content from Seat, I've got a couple of other, work on a couple of other podcasts. I did a bunch of interviews um, with some of my mates at Seat. So there'll be episode 13 and, sorry, episode 14 and 15 will be very uh, seat heavy um, with some interviews from guys from the NBA, MLB, uh, NFL, and of course, Christine Stoffel, who put the conference on and did a remarkable job with over 450 people in in Kansas City. Um, It was great to see the CRM and the digital tracks uh, growing from what was a small base last year in Boston. Um, I expect all all of you listening to the podcast to be at seat 2014 um, in New York. But for now, we're still looking at seat 2013. So here is my presentation, Digital Case Studies Explained with Philippe Dor from NASCAR. Enjoy. We'll get started. Um, thanks a lot for coming along. Uh, my name is uh, Sean Cullinan and I'll be presenting with Philippe here, and uh, we'll be going through some digital campaigns, so I'll let you get get things started. Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of looking forward to have Sean present uh, to us. Usually he's the moderator and talking all the time, so we pulled some good uh, case studies here. Hopefully you'll find helpful still. Um, Let's jump right in. Um, So we discussed uh, what would be the best, uh, you know, what, what makes a digital campaign uh, successful? So we call it a trifecta. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the first thing was, was around content. Like, we're all in the content business. Uh, we're fighting against Fox, ESPN, you know, Sporting News, all these other places. So most of our campaigns should be around our content and pushing it out. So we'll be focusing on, on campaigns that profile content. The next one we're looking at is Engagement, um, you know, everything we're doing in social is about engagement and in engaging the fan and, deep, and deepening the ties with the fan. So a lot of the campaigns, again, uh, that we've got uh, through the deck are on engagement. And then we've got one more component, which is for our friends in the other track, uh, which is data. You know, so if we're going to have a campaign, you know, having a, some component of that that gets, um, gets some data, gets some email, geolocation data, as I was just talking about, before with mobile, um, you know, so if you can hit the trifecta and get tick those three boxes, um, you're doing well. But you don't have to with every every single campaign. So we'll just go through a couple of campaigns and show that they've got different focus and what they were trying to do, and talk about you know what they were trying to do, how they did it, how they went, and for some of them, you know, what we might do differently. That's right. Uh, so the first one, Sean, is. Uh West Coast, uh, you're part of the world, so why don't you tell them? Yeah, so uh, West Coast and Eagles are a, uh, an Australian rules uh, company. Just to give you a background of what they're, what they're like, they've, they've got a full stadium, they've got a waiting list, um, you know, their, their season ticket base is, is getting older, um, but they've got this waiting list they want to keep in, engaging. And usually they would do a, a season, t- season ticket renewal, um, you know, uh, sort of TBC at the start of the season, but 
since they didn't need to sell the tickets, they um, this last year they just went with a real brand campaign and just wanted to build excitement around the brand. And they did that around a video campaign. And so this is one of the videos featuring Nick Nat Nui. Access to the players and, and started to build up the season. And uh, Mark Lacra was the guy running past. So the next video was a backstory into him. So they ran the video campaign. They pushed out to YouTube. They promoted it both on YouTube and Facebook. Um, and really, the, the fans just rallied around it. And they, you know, it was really good around that high-end content. I'm sure you all now want to have a holiday in Western Australia. Um, they could probably do that as a tourism ad. So that's the that's the West Coast one. Great. So this one is uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves, again a content play um, around the NBA draft. Uh, so the NBA draft, you know, gets stacks of coverage on the ESPN, um, but once your pick happens, um, they start to admit every other team. Um, and what the Timberwolves have done, Timberwolves have done in their draft for the last three years, they're hoping to not do this eventually and actually make the playoffs. Um, but what they have done is been doing a live streaming. Um, show from their venue with a big, you know, and they have a big fan event. So they have, you know, talking heads, talking about the draft, interviews with fans. Um, over the last three years, there have been increasing sponsorship and activations around it. So, again, really profiling their talent as far as their digital team. Um, but, you know, their fans really are rallying around that, that site for that night. This is, a, this is a close one to my heart because this is my Achilles brother, uh, Kobe Bryant. Um, this is, a, I don't know if you saw this campaign. Um, this is a campaign from, I think it was 2011, uh, around that, that Nike ran. Um, we've got a video that pretty much explains how it ran. On any night, Kobe Bryant can transform without warning into an unstoppable force. Black Mamba. What is Black Mamba all about? That's my alter ego. When you step on the basketball court, you gotta get into another frame of mind. It's about shifting and going to your zone. The Black Mamba. An alter ego beloved by fans and feared by the competition. We set out to mimic Kobe's physical transformation into the Black Mamba on NikeBasketball.com. So when Kobe transforms, the site transforms with him. Since fans routinely call out the Black Mamba on social networks, a custom-made Twitter algorithm was programmed to generate and monitor real-time global social chatter and transform the site using Kobe-related tweets as a trigger. Every time the Mamba struck, fan social chatter would cause the automated site to change from normal Kobe state to the Black Mamba state once 1,750 tweets per hour were surpassed. During each of these Mamba moments, the site would offer exclusive access to content for the next six hours, like Kobe video interviews, personalized wallpapers, and a chance for fans to win exclusive Nike ID Zoom Kobe 6 kicks. As Mamba moments grew closer, the traffic on NikeBasketball.com exploded as social chatter spread across the web. 
A real-time Twitter tracker showed fans exactly how many Kobe-related tweets were being posted at that moment, and how many were needed to transform the site and unlock the Mamba content. Fans around the world would watch the Twitter <laughs> working collectively to try and push the needle over the edge. Every time a Mamba moment happened, Nike basketball spread the word with posts on social networks across the globe. As a special surprise for fans, a short film directed by Robert Rodriguez starring Trejo, Willis, Evil Kanye, and the Black Mama himself dropped a couple days before All-Star Weekend, driving even more traffic to the site. Then at the All-Star Game on February 20th, Kobe Bryant scored a game-high 37 points en route to winning his fourth career All-Star MVP award. Global Black Mama social chatter lit up the boards. The site transformed from Kobe to Black Mama in the first quarter. Notifications went out across Facebook, Twitter, RedRed, and Weibo. Over 2 million fans had visited NikeBasketball.com to watch Kobe transform into the Black Mamba. Night in and night out, the site continues to reflect Kobe's transformation on the court. The Black Mamba may strike without warning, but not without reward for the fans across the world. Yeah, so that one's just an example where it's hit the mark on all, on all counts, like the producing the killer content, but you can only get the content if you get the engagement, uh, the getting the fans, you know, riled up on, on Twitter. And this was all done before Kobe was even on Twitter. So they were even able to show it without even having him being one that, that drives it. So, um, you know, phenomenal campaign, and I hope he makes it come back from his Achilles because it will give me hope. <laughs> and again, this is a great execution. Uh, we're, we're finding a theme, a theme here. You'll see that the best execution are during live events. So that was, it's nice to see as he's playing, you do this. A lot of the other case studies here that we have are very, very focused on live engaging uh, content. Um, this is another one from, uh, from the tennis world. So uh, Australian Open Tennis, have all, I've been partnering with IBM for years. They've got pretty cool slam trackers for live results. Uh, they kicked it up a notch uh, this year uh, and added a social component. So you can actually measure uh, the tweets, the trending module, and also what I like with this one is that they also added sentiment. Uh, so negative, positive, so it's kind of give it a little little kick to just more than having to show just uh, who's trending, who's got the most tweet, tweets or something like that. So pretty cool execution here from, from uh, IBM and the Australian Open. And it, it, again, it reinforces if you go to the next part, like it shows the tweets coming in for, for Andy Murray. I mean, we all know that you know, Twitter especially works uh, well in live sport and, and for a certain degree sport has made Twitter um, because that's where everyone is on. Um, Wimbledon pretty much followed up with something similar and sort of got into that infotainment sort of space, uh, taking all the stats um, and repurposing it. So that's the thing, you know, you can take this engagement piece and make it part of your content strategy. Um, you know, infographics are really... You know, hot part of uh, content marketing at the minute, so you can show you know the buzz, and it's a good way of expressing to the fans that they're part of a bigger collective. You know, it gives them a little bit of a push. It shows here the the buzz around the world and uh, and the media that uh, that Wimbledon have uh, provided uh, throughout the throughout the tournament. Yes, and the the geo mapping, we we've got several other examples here. It seems like it's uh it's getting a little bit of buzz here's a good example here wants to talk to us about this one so this is one that we did uh three weeks ago um we were planning to do it and then we we're lucky enough that manchester united decided to join twitter which made the made the event a little bit more successful um you may have seen trendsmap.com uh, before um it has local versions and global versions um and it shows trends uh from twitter um, on a map, which is what the name Trends Map. Um, but what we've done, because uh, the guys have, uh, who built it are actually based out of Melbourne, uh, we've, we've helped them sort of make a product out of it um, and allowed them to build a product that, that can be pivoted around a sport. So in this case, we track the game day hashtag and the Man United and the A-League. So the A-League is the Australian um, MLS. And so we're able to show uh, the trends around the world, uh, heat maps in both Australia and, and in the UK, uh, we're able to uh, bubble up the popular content from a from a um, image point of view, and also the videos. So any vines that were that were being shared and retweeted by fans, just click up and show more. Um, they're all able to be played in in line, um, as well as showing what popular users. And if you see the if you go down one more, um, it also would profile the top tweets. 
And so a couple of things that we learned, especially having a uh, David and Goliath battle, in this case, with Manchester United, even though they were on for three weeks, um, who was watching when they joined joined Twitter and they were just adding followers like by the thousands by the minute. There were people going, oh, I've got more followers than Man United. Not anymore. Um, so they've got so many followers, like they dominated that top, top board. So like we're going to probably most likely break that out to be different teams. Um, but the other thing that it also showed is uh, the popular links that were being shared by fans. So again, another way those links are hot, they can go back to your site. It also would profile all the fans that were sharing illegal content. So we had to put in measures to say we don't want those links on this page. Um, but it's a, you know, a good way to get, in, get fans back to your um, back to your site. And so similar to the to the Wimbledon thing, we took content from this in the back end analytics and we repurposed it back to to social to tell the fans, hey, way to go, you're part of this. So if you if you flick the slide. Um, you know, we sent out half-time tweets telling them what the top cities were, um, how many tweets were coming in, uh, what the work map looked, looked like, just to sort of repurpose it um, and, and take it through. So this one, I think you had this one. Yeah, this is uh, an example from earlier this year uh, from Under Armour. Um, pretty good execution. They've invested, seems like they invested quite a bit of money. It's, uh, they went multi-channel. Uh, made a lot of noise to it. Um, they're basically asking the uh, fans or the consumer to uh, to use the hashtag hashtag I will uh, and offering giveaways for how they're gonna um, do something great this year. So and so pretty much yeah, they were just asking people to either write or share a photo. I mean, when I first looked at this, I thought you know it looks great, but they really didn't bring the social component um, until the last bit. So like they said, yeah, you can put your, you can write on the wall. So if you keep clicking through, and then it asks you at the end, I'll oh, share this. And so the incentive wasn't there for it to really go viral. If they had have said, oh, sign in with Facebook, hit the button, it's automatic, automatically going to get shared. So sort of try the, try the email piece, but again, you didn't have, to, it wasn't mandatory. Um, so you know, I haven't got the data as far as what they, what they secured, but had they flipped, and like the next slide, I think shows. You know, thank you for sharing your your message. Please share it. Please tweet it. Um, you know, if you move that to the front, uh, like I was saying before with the apps, um, if you get people to be signing in with the social connections at the front, the likelihood that they will share is uh, is much greater. So this one is a really unique one from uh, Tunisia. So just watch the video and see what they did.
Yeah, so that one's a pretty amazing case study. Um, they didn't have Wi-Fi problems on that day. Um, <laughs> but it just sort of shows you, I think you click the, I guess just how you can engage that fan at home and thinking outside the box um, with some, some activations. But yeah, pretty phenomenal uh, story of having to run out there without any fans at all and, and being able to connect those fans in that sort of crowdsourced, make them feel a part of it. Um, so if you can build your campaigns around in that sort of manner, um, you know, the big one. Yeah, that's the lesson, be creative as crazy as you can. Um, and thanks. Initially, I think Sean wanted me to translate the French to English, but the <laughs> subtitle here. So this one, um, I don't know if you've uh, seen it, and uh, it's Mound Ball. It's run by the guys at uh, Major League Baseball, and we'll be able to play it tonight. <laughs> we'll be able to play it tonight because there's a, a Royals Mound Ball. This is just an example of a pure engagement piece, just having fun on the platform. And so the way Mound Ball works is... Um, if the pitcher leaves the ball on the base, then they're going to give away a prize. If he doesn't, they're not. So they've got these fans now tuning in to see where the ball is going to be in between innings and doing it via Twitter. Um, so it's completely stupid, um, but it's, but it's you know, they've now got, I think if you click, um, they launched it a couple of weeks ago. They're only doing it with a couple of teams at the moment, um, but they've already got 5,000 followers. So there's already all playing. So it's just, again... It's, a, it's that thinking outside the box, how can we engage our fans in a weird way? You know, we were talking in some of the sessions earlier today and, you know, if you have a team that's not winning or things aren't going well, how can you make these, you know, these silly events into some sort of activation, into some sort of engagement play with the fans? Um, and it seems to be working, you know, pretty well for, for, uh, for MLB. So... I'm going to be tweeting Mound Ball tonight to see if uh, I mean, I'll be watching very close at the end of innings to see where the ball was placed. But uh, just again, just shows you the, the, the advantages of just playing on the platform for what they are. And, you know, it's a really good spot for, for Twitter. And so this one you brought, Philippe, from uh, uh, Tour de yes, France? Yes, Tour de France uh, in, uh, in France, obviously. Um, good execution here from France TV. Basically, it's an Instagram base. Uh, at each stop, uh, people were asked to upload their Instagram photo and obviously with the geolocation. So it created this entire um, record document here that they put online here. So and this one's great because it shows, it's that crowdsourcing, it shows how colorful and awesome it is to be at the Tour de France. And it's perfect for Instagram because you've got all the crazy filters. Everything that you produce on an Instagram photo is beautiful, or so people think. Um, but it shows all the colour. I mean, again, because it's because Instagram is more uh, geo friendly than than Twitter. Um, you know, it's great to be able to show here's all the all the content. So you know, for me, this one is really great because it's profiling the fan content. Like we've done stuff with with tournaments and stadiums, you know, getting your fans to take those shots and send them in um, is a great way of doing it. And being able to, you know, activate around a, around a map and show off uh, show off what the fans are seeing is a really uh, good way of doing it. Ball example. So this is, yeah, so this is sort of similar to um, the Timberwolves uh, stuff around the, the draft. So this is the uh, Falcons... Quickly, social hub again, making it and making the uh, the draft an event and giving them a place to consume everything um, is from a point of view of you know their their pics and all their social social content. So sharing both their their content and some of the fans. So it's getting into that social curation space that which I think is good because you want to make sure your fans are connecting with other fans. Um, I think it was, I can't remember what session it was before even Chris was saying how he's got, um, you know, 20 or 30 of these brand champions. You need to be publicising those brand champions and things like this so they know that they're doing the right thing. And again, those work well during an event. Right? Yeah, so this is perfect. That the entire season, you get a little... Yeah, so again, this is, you know, during the draft, so they're, they've been craving for information and they don't have as much. And so this kind of activation works really well for that. These guys did as well. Right? So this is the, the, the St. Louis Rams one. So I think this is with Wayne. I'm going to get a nod at the back, yeah? Yeah, this is with Wayne. 
Um, again, so about you know, pro ask the fans questions, uh, profile your content around around the draft. So again, it just gives them that different. You know, Twitter is good to give the, those different visualizations. Because not everyone follows everyone that they need to do. Not everyone knows how to follow a hashtag. Um, you know, so fans still need these kind of visualizations to understand why they should be on Twitter, um, or you know, or why they should be on Pinterest, or why they should be on Tumblr. So, you know, you want to be able to show these different representations of what they think might be normal, um, but show it in a different way to say, oh, that's why I want to be um, accessing that uh, that content. So if you scroll down, it's it's bringing in all the tweets. Yeah. And just real quick at the top, also I like how they added uh, some interactivity. So it's one thing to just bring in photos and call it a day, but if you take it to the next level and have people tweet, or even I would like to see maybe an input box there, maybe you can populate a hashtag, just do it right there. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, I think you can click the buttons and it will be effective voting for that. Uh, Perfect. And here's the mosaic board. There. So the next, so this one. Um, is another Nike activation that they did around a women's running race um, in Sydney. Um, I'll let the video explain it, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the stuff that they did with Facebook to sort of integrate the social component. Within the female running community, Nike wasn't seen as a credible choice for serious runners. In fact, most female runners wore Nike from head to ankle but found it hard to commit to wearing Nike on their feet. We also uncover the truth that when women ran, they ran alone. They were left to overcome their fears and achieve their goals by themselves. To us, this seemed at odds with women's natural inclination to discuss, share, and to overcome barriers together. In light of this, our idea was simple. As a female runner, you're far stronger and more powerful when you're part of a group than you could ever be as an individual. There is true power in numbers. We use this thought to ignite a community of female runners, empowering them to redefine their sport and change the way they train forever. We started our conversation through social media with a rally cry for change, stimulating chat around the barriers women face. It was during this conversation that we realized we needed to tackle the biggest barrier of all, running alone at night. We began by recruiting women who already had the courage to run in the dark. We received hundreds of responses from women whose stories inspired an online short film. And the more of us that run, the brighter we can burn. Next, we challenged our community by announcing that we would hold a 13k night race for runners. The film also acted as a registration device that could be personalized to every runner and passed on to their friends, celebrating grassroots runners across gyms, online, in-store, print, and outdoor, which in turn inspired other women to join the movement. Every piece of communication incorporated an invitation to a mini Women's Only Run Club. Hey, I'm Daniela. I'm Greg. I'm Veronica. If you're interested in night running, then come for a run with us at PMOC. Allowing women to not only train for the 13K run, but connect with other women along the way trying to unite female runners at every touch point, enabling them a way to share their stories, goals, and achievements. Race night became a celebration. For one night, women turned the tables on the dark. We smashed down our own barriers too, exceeding all expectations and KPIs. For us, this demonstrates the power of a culturally connected idea, one that helps a community to form, shifts perceptions, and ultimately changes how people interact with a brand. We set out to shake up running for women and sparked a movement that unleashed a powerful, thriving community, a community that's still running. Yeah, so that campaign was uh, heavily uh, integrated with Facebook. So like they said there, they had a Facebook registration um, process. And it was, so obviously that's terrific from a, from a data point of view. So they were getting the data of all the registrants, um, the engagement and the content side of things, again, absolutely killing it um, as far as the content they were producing, but then also getting their fans to produce it. Uh, the race itself, um, because everyone had registered with Facebook and everyone had the Nike Plus tracking devices, as the women were coming up to the 5K mark, 
their Facebook avatar came up on the digital screen and said, keep going. And so, like, you know, they were like, oh, didn't realise and charging on. So, like, they really um, stepped up, I guess, the integration with the Facebook Connect and the registration and put it through the whole race. Um, so a really, you know, powerful way of one developing the community around um, around the event. This one you said through pretty recent. Uh, yes, yes, I thought this was uh, great. Again, engaging the fans. Uh, so PGA Championship um, with uh, Jack Nichols here. I think there's this, but yeah. So it allowed, it allowed the fans to pick uh, the pin position. Yeah. So, I mean, in the end, this is just a perfectly multiple choice sweepstakes competition. Um, but the fact that they've got, um, you know, the content pieces there, the fans can check the flyover, you know, it's got a bit of buzz. It's really high value for a golf fan to be able to say where they're going to pick the pin. Um, you know, I'm sure there'll be a few golfing buddies that have got bragging rights when, yeah, I went with C, they picked C, I was obviously right. Um, but it's just, you know, it's more unique than just saying, you know, tell us who, who's your favourite golfer or, you know, what kind of, when do you play golf, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I think it worked really well. It got really good press as well because it was in that crowdsourcing space, effectively allowing the fans to decide. Um, sometimes you've got to be careful because sometimes the fans don't know what they're doing. But in this case, uh, if they're happy with one of the four four options, it's a, it's a good play. And, and it's fun because they actually make an impact. It's not just what do you think and, oh, I would love to see this. It's actually the thing's going to move. Uh, we had a similar example at NASCAR with, where we asked a fan to uh, vote on the format of our uh, all-star race. Do you want 30 laps? Do you want 60 laps? If we make them decide, then we go for it. Our competition goes for it. So nice way for them to, to feel... Uh, and it gives them that emotional connection because they're, they're feeling like a part of the decision process. So this one is uh, one that we did with the Auckland Blues um, using Digital Cheer Squad, where it was pretty much rewarding fans for what they were doing um, on social networks, so Facebook and Twitter. Um, but it wasn't exactly, you know, it wasn't the platform that did it. It was the way that the Blues ran it. Um, they really focused on uh, servicing these fans because they're, the, they're they're really avid uh, super fans. Um, and some of the stuff that generated out of it, which if you can go back was like they found that the fans started congregating and sitting together. So now they're going to have a specific bay so these fans can all sit together. They started running events specifically for these super fans and getting really great results because these fans were trained on what they wanted to do. They would stand in front of the sponsor banner. They knew they had to face, uh, Facebook it and tweet it and Instagram it. Um, so it's worked out really well um, and to the point where, you know, We've got to the point where we said, oh, don't forget to thank the sponsor because they've provided uh, True Blue HQ and they've been sent 194 tweets saying, thanks, guys. Um, now, Barfoot and Thompson, they're not in the te technical space. They're a real estate agent. But the uh, social manager at Barfoot and Thompson loves it because their feed is full of people praising how awesome they are. Um, I've actually got a meeting with them next week or when I get back. I'm hoping that we get the research back that says, yes, we sold a house because someone came in because all, your, all the Blues fans have been tweeting about us as a real estate agent um, all, all, uh, all winter. Um, you know, and then from a content point of view, um, if you go next, you know, we've been doing stuff like um, uh, infographics around the stats of what the fans have been doing, but then also profiling the fans with a simple fan of the week. And because we've connected all of those fans, um, the amount of digital backslapping that happens when you announce a fan of the week because they all know each other, they're all friends now that have met in real life, which I think is, you know, having those fan events and connecting those digital fans just locks them in. You know, then they will always be talking about your team. You know, they become friends and, you know, so every time we announce a, every time the Blues announce a fan of the week, um, they all get retweeted from them, uh, from everyone in the list. Um, they're all pretty pleased with themselves. The other key component of it was putting the ladder and integrating it in the rest of the site. To sort of, again, you know, the fans are pretty happy to see their to see their face on the on the regular side. So you had the uh, the sponsors sponsoring the program right there, right? Yeah. And and we're seeing a lot of that. Our our partner now does are not just asking 
uh, for banner ads, things like that. They want to engage with the content and social is the right way to do it. So we're, we're cooking it, a lot of things like that uh, at NASCAR. So this is another one that's, um, again, it goes back to the map thing, but it's more around engagement and, and connecting your fans. So Manchester City have had this um, had this out for a while. It's still still live. Um, and effectively, it effectively allows you to tag where you are and find out where all the Manchester City fans are. So it's a terrific data play. It's, uh, you go to, say you want to tag yourself, similar to the fan cam stuff. Um, you've got to give your data to be able to tag yourself, but they're able to show, um, you know, there's 20, over 24,000 fans there, but then you can find other fans. So you can go and put someone's name in who you know is a Manchester fan, and they'll say, oh, he's in London. Um, you know, and so you can connect with your friends or tag your friends and that kind of thing. So again, it's about making a connection, but also showing that, you know, there's 482 in Melbourne and there's, you know, uh, 1,100 in uh, the eastern seaboard of the US. Um, so it just shows you that uh, there's, there's like people around you. Um, and yeah, pretty much for, for Manchester City, it's about, like they've extended this now and they're providing, they're building local, localised uh, websites um, for different regions around the world and pretty much based off this data. They know they've got the fans there, so they can now build the sites. So this one was primarily a data play um, with the Melbourne Storm. Um, so the video there is uh, we ran a, effectively a competition saying, hey, come along the journey, uh, come along the journey jersey, um, come along the journey in the finals. Uh, and we asked them to enter their details and we built this uh, it's about a green um, jersey with all the all the fans' names on it, and we we told the fans it's going to be in the locker room during the playoffs, so the players will run past it, they'll touch it, or they'll we'll tell them they'll they'll touch it, and um, and so it was their way of being in the locker room um, during the playoffs, um, and so we put, you know we initially uh, did it, then we produced a secondary one to have it out in the concourse and all the fans. Um, to get their uh, photo in front of it. So in a week, uh, I think we collected 1,500 emails of, of fans that wanted to be part of it. We then added the season ticket holder base to the, to the jersey, so it had 1,500 in the end. Um, on top of getting all the social sort of attraction that the fans um, gave it, um, it got, got earned media with the, with the uh, local te television and the, the broadcasters showing off the jersey um, both in the in the locker room and then around grand final week and all's all's well that ends well we, uh, to win the uh, win the championship that's uh, last year so um, yeah the Storm fans have have fond memories of the journey jersey so we're now trying to figure out how we can uh, um, take it to the next level uh, this year that's right and again it's one thing to upload a, a photo to Instagram it's another thing to seeing it you know uh, an execution like this. Uh, we've done it on some cars as well, right? Because last year's done it, Ryan Newman's done it, where you put your photo and you get that little avatar on the car. And we're working on another one right now for uh, for the chase, where we'll feature uh, a prize winner, their Twitter handle on, on the car. So we're working on that right now. So this is one of the um, one of the last one, one of the last ones we'll look at. Uh, we thank you, Sir Alex. So the Man, Man United. Um, said goodbye to Sir Alex Ferguson. Um, again, they weren't on Twitter at this stage, um, but from a content and an engagement and a data point of view, um, they absolutely smashed it. Um, so they built this mini site, um, they they integrated with, they did some work with Twitter and, and pretty much pushed out the hashtag, thank you Sir Alex, which was trending worldwide. I think they were like eight minutes, something ridiculous. It went really uh, exceptionally viral, um, but what they did, do is ask all their fans to post messages. So if you're already in the Manchester United system, you could just log in and leave your message for Sir Alex. Um, but what they did is they sent it out to their, I think it's 35 million Facebook fan base. It's a ridiculous number. Um, but just click and just, this is the picture that they put up on Facebook. Um, send Sir Alex your thank you message and we're going to create him a book. They could have just said, give us your email, please. Um, because all they did was send them to a buddy media Facebook tab that said email, name, uh, date of birth, oh, and 25 words to Sir Alex. Um, 
But the good thing is that they didn't just like, they didn't just stop there. They took all that content and they created a book. They leather bound it. They did a couple of different versions. They got Sir Alex to sign it, and there you go. It's now it's a prize. It's a limited edition piece. Um, but yeah, 161,000 people like that post. Like they really capitalised on the traffic that they got. Um, you know, for Sir Alex signing. Um, so for for them, they absolutely absolutely like I said, smashed this this activation out of the park to, to one. They knew they were going to get great engagement from their fans. Um, the unfortunate thing is uh, four days later uh, when they was because um, they had to replace, obviously, Sir Alex Ferguson, uh, Ferguson and uh, David Moyes was pegged to, to be the new, uh, now he now is the new uh, manager. Unfortunately, um, and, you know, we've all had mistakes, unfortunately they tweeted out the link to the app to say, welcome, David Moyes, two days before he signed. And he was still working at Chelsea. Uh, so they deleted the tweet, but no, nah, you can't delete a tweet, it's gone. So, like, they did everything right for Sir Alex, but, uh, yeah, it was a little bit awkward for the first day or two when they were uh, an announcing David Moyes, but trying to follow the same thing. But, yeah, if you look at some of the data that was coming through, both from a Twitter point of view, again, for a team that wasn't on Twitter, um, but then to uh, get some of that content uh, was was uh, pretty phenomenal. To sort of to sort of wrap up and uh, not not go too long because I can only stand so long in this foot. Um, the main things that you know when you are going to go and do a campaign, and you know you're going to be tackling one of these three things. You know you're going to promote your content, um, you know engage your fans and and get data. You know, I don't think you need to do all three with every one. Like, you will have ones that just naturally do all three. Um, or, you know, a killer like the like Mamba or the, uh, the Nike one that do all three. But then, you know, then you'll have ones like Mountain that's just pure engagement. Um, so it is, you know, I think it is important to know that you want to try to tackle one of those three and have a goal around that, um, which sort of leads us to our takeaways from the session is to, first of all, to, to know your goal, to know what you're trying to achieve out of it, um, rather than, I think you were talking about um, when we we're doing the prep stuff, you don't want to just do something, you know, that's cute. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, you know, you want to know what your goal is, and so if your goal is engagement, you know, cute can work, but you've got to make sure you push that. That's right. Um, so this one, you know, I call market your marketing. Um, I've seen a lot of teams put a lot of effort into building some activation and then just push it out and think it's going to happen. And it's, you know, it's a bit like the brief, can you make me a viral video? Um, which no one can ever do when you ask them that. But so for this is, you know, market your marketing. And so it's one, you know, how are you pushing this out? Um, you know, it, are you, where are you advertising? Are you advertising it in stadium? You know, are you augmenting it with uh, Facebook ads or Google ads or, you know, promoting it with Twitter? Um, because you can't just expect, oh, our fans will just love that and, and eat it up. So, you know, it's, there's nothing worse than spending a lot of time and um, money and effort uh, putting something together and if you don't, and then stop putting in that effort once you've pushed it out. So you've really got to still market it um, uh, or fire all your channels. And on on the, the goals market, remember the data from your initial slides, so make sure you get something out of it Use Connect. You, got, you can get a lot of data on Facebook. If you're doing a fan cam, you know, contest, you can get registrant, you can get tons of those. So, uh, good, good, big ROI of how you oh, get something out of the, the program. So, and, and you got to make it, and you got to make it fun. You've got to have, for mine, you know, you've got to think about, think about it from a fan point of view. Um, you know, I know all of us will have seen ad sponsor promotions forced onto us, and we've had to push back to say the fans won't want it. Um, you really need to have that fan hat on and will they think it's fun, will it have, like Mike was saying, will it have the payoff for them and the payoff might be, you know, their Instagram shot gets on the screen or, um, or that they might have a tour or, or something but it, it really does have to be, um, you know, fun and, and enticing to the fan. So that pretty much uh, wraps up our sort of uh, showcase of different digital uh, global, global, global showcase. Global, global showcase. <laughs> glad to have the Tunisians involved. Um, more than happy to take any questions or.
talk about different parts of digital campaigns. You can go to the next slide. So if this is recorded properly, uh, this will this will be a future sports geek podcast. If it didn't record pop properly, Philippe and I will be doing this again and recording it for a future sports geek podcast. So hopefully it's recorded, and if it's not, then uh, we'll be back on Skype and recording it again. So thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy the baseball and. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Find all Sports Geek podcasts at sportsgeekhq.com slash SGP. Thanks for listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. <laughs>